So without much ado, I'll move on to the lecture. The lecture is Elevating Wellness, a Holistic Approach to Health and Lifestyle. Actually, there's nothing new here, everything you know, but uh, we are just bringing it under one umbrella term, the wellness. So it's kind of new. The concept is new. It has been there. It has been, it's been used by many other non-medical people, but I think it's time we took over uh, in this. Uh, so uh, just to walk you through the lecture, uh, I'll be just introducing you to the concept of illness wellness paradigm and some definitions and importance of it to the physicians. And then uh, the wellness wheel, which has, eight, which has eight dimensions. And I'll delve much more deeper into the physical wellness. Uh, because that is much more interesting for all of us as physicians and an overview of the other seven dimensions of wellness and uh, important points to consider when planning a strategic wellness program or individual personalized uh, interventions. So, okay, illness wellness paradigm. Now, all of you in the curative sector are more interested in diseases that and then curing diseases. So that is towards the red side of this paradigm. But when we talk about wellness, it's towards the other green side. So most of us here actually and most of us in the community are in this comfort zone that is in the neutral zone where we don't have any symptoms but, and the nutrition may be inconsistent. Maybe we are uh, exercising on and off, but health is not much of a priority. But if we take uh, this wellness concept into consideration, we'll be moving towards this green zone where high level of wellness will actually guarantee 100% of function and continuous development and active participation in anything you do, right? So we are going to bring out the best, your best self out through this concept of wellness. Right, so what is wellness then? Wellness is uh, actually the first uh, definition I have put here is more or less similar to the uh, WHO health uh, definition. But if you look, with the quote I have given here, a lifestyle and a personalized approach to living life in a way that allows you to bring out your best self, right? So the best way you can function. So I want you all to re reflect about yourself, whether you are there actually. And according to the National Wellness Institute, the wellness actually is a, an active process of becoming aware. You have to be self-aware about your own health status and what you are doing to uh, upgrade it and make informed choices towards a more successful existence. Okay, then what is well-being? That is a similar uh, thing, but then it's a state of happiness and contentment. We are not talking about, uh, you know, an active process here. It's a state of feeling happy. You know, you can feel happy even without doing a single exercise or uh, eating whatever you like, KFC, pizza, whatever you like, and then feeling happy. So it's a, it's a low level of distress and feeling content and happy with yourself, but then there may be an overlap or so some physical activity you may be doing according to your liking, but it, uh, it, it actually gives the meaning of a good quality of life in itself. So what, is, what are the differences of wellness and well-being? So wellness is concerns, actions, or intents, whereas well-being is a state of being. And uh, so wellness obviously has some physical elements, whereas well-being is more towards the mental status, mental elements. And then wellness is associated with a healthy lifestyle. Uh, well-being is associated with fulfillment, containment, satisfaction with whatever the, yourself is. 
And the more important thing I wanted to emphasize here is well-being uh, is, uh, you know, a measure of individual welfare. And by research, you can uh, just enumerate the uh, status of the well-being and then use that to upgrade uh, the uh, whatever the health uh, facilities you have. But wellness is something a business like thing. It's a wellness economy, right? So the global wellness economy in uh, year two, 2020 is 4.4 trillion US dollars. I don't know what it will be in rupees. So many uh, zeros will be added, right? If you convert it, but look at the components. Wellness tourism, personal care and beauty. So cosmetology comes in. Uh, healthy eating, nutrition and weight loss, physical activity. So there comes the gyms and all those things. Then wellness real estate. So you have uh, retreats, right? So where you can attract people uh, for all this yoga, nutrition, detoxifying your body and all those things. Then these light pink blobs you have here, the traditional and complementary medicine, that is Ayurvedic, if you come uh, refer to Sri Lanka, and public health prevention and personalized medicine. So there we come actually there. And if you can see, the blobs are actually connected, interconnected. So uh, the addition will not be uh, 4.4 trillion, yeah, because there's an overlap. So why I'm telling you this is, it's uh, this is part of our thing. So being medical graduates, we should be involved in this type of thing as well. Not only the Ayurvedic or the complementary medical people. So this is in this economic crisis, I'm telling you, and, and I want to emphasize that we, because more and more quacks are coming in without knowing uh, who will be practicing uh, malpractices actually. So, but if we, the scientific people, the medical people take over, this can be a, a good uh, opportunity for most of the doctors here. Right, so those are the differences in wellness and well-being. So importance of wellness for physicians, for your own uh, personal well-being, patient care. So if you are more caring about yourself, you naturally would be caring towards your patients also. So then effective patient education. So you need to know a lot about wellness when you are uh, trying to educate people, patients uh, with regards to many uh, diseases, then preventing burnout. So to meet everyday, day-to-day -day challenges, to meet uh, deadlines. So things like that, wellness concept is important and long longevity in the profession. So if you want to uh, have more satisfaction and to, uh, you know, uh, like what you are doing, so all these concepts can be uh, can come in. Then enhance resilience. So whatever you do to do with more energy and uh, more uh, resilience, uh, this wellness is important. And for role modeling. So if you are, you know, the public will be always take you as a role model. Your outlook, how you function yourself, you know, everything is important. So therefore, it's important for, for you as a physician. And as I said, uh, as an income also, you can uh, turn it into an income generating uh, venture also. And more than that, uh, so it's our responsibility because at national and uh, global level, we have a goal to meet the sustainable development goal three uh, set by the UN so it uh, we have to work towards this so that is ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages so through that SGD we can uh, actually uh, 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 we can achieve the rest of the 16 uh, sustainable development goals that I have, I, I didn't mean you all to read this actually, only the, the green, the goal three is enough, but through that we can, through this concept and uh, through that we other targets and strategies, we can attain the rest of the uh, sustainable development goals too. Okay, so the wellness wheel, I'll just uh, go through all the elements of the wellness. So physical is recognizing the need for physical activity, sleep and nutrition. Then 
spiritual is expanding our sense of uh, uh, purpose and uh, measure uh, uh, and meaning of life. So then, um, we have the emotional awareness that is coping effectively with life and creating satisfied re relationships and intellectual uh, uh, wellness, which is identifying creative ab abilities and expanding knowledge and skills and social wellness, which is having a sense of connection and a dependable support system. And then we have the occupational wellness, which is personal satisfaction and enrichment from one's work. And then we have the environmental uh, wellness, good health through pleasant environments that support well-being. And then, of course, the financial well-being, which is satisfaction with current and future financial situations and goals. And then moving on to the physical wellness. So, okay, you know all this more than me, I'm pretty sure. But uh, just touching for the completeness sake regular exercising, healthy eating, taking supplements when, when, when and where it is indicated, then adequate sleep, maintaining good hygiene, avoiding alcohol, tobacco, and substance abuse, healthy sexual relationships, and screening for NCDs, uh, among many others, right? So, okay. So if you all are interested, you all can go and read this, the global strategy on diet, physical activity and health. So I won't go into all the uh, details in this. So there are so many things that uh, we have identified and are being recommended. So I'm sure you must be learning them under so many specialities. So then the impact of unhealthy diets, physical inactivity and tobacco. So uh, we know that uh, cardiovascular diseases, type two diabetes and certain types of cancer are you know, uh, the global burden of disease uh, have be, uh, the, the study on a global burden of disease has uh, identified that these uh, diseases actually significantly uh, contribute to the death and dis disability of the world. And then apart from that, dental caries, osteoporosis, all those are also uh, related to diet. And major risk factors of uh, non-communicable diseases include uh, the elevated consumption of energy dense, nutrient poor foods uh, that are high in fat. So why I wanted to put it is because I'm going to take it once again up in a subsequent uh, slide. And then limiting sugar and uh, salt is important. So sugar and salt is are identify risk factors and uh, reduce levels of physical activity at home, at school, at work, and, and for rec recreation and transport is also a risk factor. And use of tobacco is also a risk factor. So the number one risk factor for the global burden of disease has been identified as the, uh, you know, poor quality air. Uh, so just to cover that, I have put tobacco here. So you all know what is uh, the metabolic syndrome is. It's a condition that includes a cluster of risk factors specific for cardiovascular diseases. So how uh, physical activity uh, becomes uh, you know, beneficial for the metabolic syndrome, uh, you have to know, particularly the medical students here. So um, you know, uh, regulate physical activity, independently and in combination with a healthy diet directly uh, affect the metabolic syndrome and uh, indirectly also affect metabolic syndrome by uh, reducing the weight. So if you follow this flow diagram, you can see that it uh, affects so many risk factors of uh, uh, metabolic syndrome. So body fat accumulation will reduce, insulin sensitivity will increase, glucose tolerance will increase, plasma LDL will reduce, HDL will increase, and plasma triglycerides will reduce, blood pressure will reduce, and subsequently uh, all other things leading one to another. So I'm not going to read the whole list. So ultimate uh, would be that myocardial infarction rates, ischemic stroke rates, peripheral artery rates. So everything, even type 2 diabetes, will uh, reduce. So this is uh, really important. 
So cancer risk factors, if we take how does the excess weight and low physical activity and unhealthy diet affect cancer? So I hope that you all can remember the population attribution factor. Uh, so that is the uh, proportion of cases that would, would be prevented if the risk factor is eliminated from the community. And uh, I will just read the uh, important things here. So if you reduce excess weight, so endometrial cancer, renal cancer, liver cancer can be uh, reduced by 24 to 35% uh, in the uh, community. And uh, low physical activity, if you can reduce that and if you can get people to exercise, then endometrial cancer, renal cancer, and lung cancer can be reduced by 15 to 19%. And if you can get people to eat a healthy diet, then uh, the colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer can be reduced by 9 to 9 to 16% in the community. So uh, I have more uh, facts, but it's not the time to uh, produce that. But what are the recommendations for physical activity? So it's to do different types of and different amounts of physical activity as per the requirement uh, to guarantee whatever the health outcome that you need. That means we need to personalize. So at least uh, as a blanket recommendation, I can give you that at least 30 minutes of regular moderate to, to inten moderate intensity physical activity on most days uh, reduce the, so, uh, the risk, risks that we already discussed. So at least 30 minutes per day for five days is the minimum requirement. So you can do more than that. And then uh, you need to combine both the muscle strengthening activities and the cardio activities. And uh, it can also, uh, you know, help you with balance training and reduce falls and, you know, uh, increase uh, other things that, you know, that risks that you can come across when you are uh, aging. Uh, so more activity may be required for weight control. So cardio training and strength training, what are the differences? So in cardio training, uh, the cardiac, uh, whatever the workouts can, you know, the, for an example, aerobic activities, Zumba or running, jogging, uh, doing whatever, uh, going on the treadmill, whatever. So improve the cardiac functions, builds aerobic endurance and uh, get to and maintain a healthy weight and reduce the risks of multiple NCDs we just discussed and better performance in strength training. So for strength training, a cardio workout is essential. So strength training, don't think that it's just doing, you know, to get your muscles uh, to grow your muscles or to look like the Hulk or something like that. It's not. So uh, it's an important part of exercising. So it builds the muscle mass, prevent muscle atrophy and increase the strength and function and optimal bone health and improve the resting metabolic rate. So dietary recommendations, I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, you know, uh, as an overview, uh, it's important to achieve the uh, energy balance and a healthy weight. So you have to limit certain things like total fats and shift fat consumption away from saturated fats to unsaturated fats and towards the elimination of trans fatty acids. So that is that should be your guide. And then increase consumption of fruits and vegetables and legumes, whole grains and nuts, and limit the intake of free sugars and limit salt and limit uh, processed foods. So those are some of the uh, you know, guidelines. So this food-based dietary guidelines uh, that we the uh, issued by the Ministry of Health is a good guide if you all want to refer. Uh, it's available on the net uh, freely. So if you want to go into more details about these things, it's available there. So more, apart from that, uh, so sleep is essential and water is essential. We all know that. And don't forget when you are going to advise your patients to mention these things. Right? So there's a food pyramid and a physical activity pyramid just for Sri Lanka. 
So I don't know whether you all are aware of these things. So these are also things that are available online for free. So you all can Google and find it. And uh, uh, you can use these things when you are advising your students and for yourself if you want to elevate your own wellness. Right. So dietary supplements wise. So now this has become a fashion. People, you know, over the online uh, websites, uh, whatever the, uh, the internet, you can get any dietary supplement you like. So, but it's not uh, recommended. So we know that iron, for iron deficiency anemia, we have to give iron and where there are uh, vegetarians, if there are vegetarians, we might have to give vitamin B12. So it is according to the uh, personal requirement. But this is an interesting fact that I'm uh, showing you. Uh, this was published by the Epidemiolo Epidemiology Unit in uh, March 2023. Apparently, nearly every six out of 10 people in Sri Lanka are vitamin D deficient. So that is nearly 60% of our deficient. And more than uh, every three out of 10 people in Sri Lanka are vitamin D insufficient. That means out of 10 people, nine of us, now if you take this audience uh, and take the number, 90% of you all are vitamin D deficient. So which means we can actually recommend vitamin D for Sri Lanka as to be taken as a supplement. So that means only one, even if this is a tropical country and we have adequate sunlight, we are not getting exposed to sunlight at the proper, you know, uh, doses that are being rec recommended. So it's worthwhile to take a vitamin D supplement. I'm not going to go into any other supplement because of the time constraints, but I thought I'll touch upon fat diets because this is also becoming very popular. So what is a fat diet? It's a popular dietary pattern known to be a quick fix for obesity. So, you know, over the internet, you may come across so many uh, diet plans, right? So offered by various groups of people or, you know, institutes or uh, pharmaceutical agencies. But then uh, there are disadvantages in uh, recommending these things and you as physicians should know why. So these diets are quite appealing due to the proposed claims, but the lack of scientific evidence is a big question mark. So there are diets called ketogenic diets, uh, Mediterranean diets, M mostly in Sri Lanka, we have the vegetarian or the vegan diets, intermittent fasting and detox diet. And we have now since of since late, uh, we have this Vannaku diet. Uh, I don't know whether you all have heard about it. So, but people, you know, uh, they actually appreciate and they uh, believe these diets more than what we are uh, offering them because of lack of knowledge. Uh, so they are very popular among people because it uh, they offer a quick uh, fix and promise dramatic results. So that's going to be, uh, the, it's a business strategy. So the disadvantage is they will be restricting or eliminating a particular nutrient component and uh, severely might uh, restrict the calories. So it can actually, in the long run, can adversely affect the patients, particularly if they are having a chronic illness. So, uh, that we need to look. And this is an example for the intermittent fasting. So the most popular one is the alternate day fasting. And uh, uh, the, the, the definition is you, uh, out of the uh, total calorie need, uh, they give you only 25%. Uh, so uh, normal eating is ad libitum. Uh, that means you can eat whatever you like to during the non-fasting period. And five to two diet or uh, periodic fasting and time restricted feeding are the types of intermittent fasting. And then um, this is the example of from Sri Lanka. I have taken it from the website of, uh, you know, the this is also done by a doctor, I presume, uh, Dr. Janaka. Uh, something we it is known as one diet or something it's actually very popular among 
non medical people i don't know why so but look it look at it uh, so avoid sugar sweets refined carbs milk vegetable oils and processed food some are good recommendations but some are not and replace carbs vegetables and fruits with fat and protein so they are he's asking to replace uh, vegetables and fruits also and carbs carbs also we need carbs you can't replace just by with fat and protein eat uh, i'm not going to go into detail but then uh, consume saturated fat as much as you want is that what we now we spoke of the dietary recommendations uh, earlier so it's we we are we are promoting the unsaturated fats right the polyunsaturated and the monounsaturated but here he says consume saturated fats then uh, but there are certain good things like meditating including sleep more than 10 hours and then water and all that uh, that there are some good points also so the characteristics of a fat diet is uh, certain missing food groups so we can't compensate with other things what micronutrients and things like that you know vegetables and fruits are very important then absence of physical activity rapid weight lo loss and incons inconsistent scientific evidence that is the uh, part that we should be more concerned then detrimental for those who are already having chronic diseases because these type of fat diets will be more appealing to that category actually but then uh, in long run they'll get into a lot of trouble because of this then maintenance issues because food craving is a side effect of this so they can rebound you know rebound uh, eating will be a big huge problem then i'm not going to go into details but for completeness sake i just put this because lack of sleep particularly for the medical students here i always tell them sleeping is a very important aspect so uh, you all can't keep awake and uh, study and uh, get through exams without you know uh, by compromising your sleep time which is essential because as uh, <laughs> so we need the your sleeping is very important and at least as on average 8 hours of sleep is needed uh, because as you can see for an adult uh, it's seven or more that is the minimum right seven hours is the minimum but when when i do take uh, when i ask the students actually i found out they don't even sleep for four hours per day which is very very uh, detrimental on their health so the, you can't achieve much by compromising on your sleep right so these are some publications that uh, are available online regarding the things that i just mentioned so it's important that if you are interested in this wellness concept that you go and read them and use them for yourselves as well as for your patients okay so in 2011 i did, when i after identifying this important uh, the uh, minister of health actually opened uh, healthy lifestyle centers and the services offered are uh, i have listed here so the screening for risk factors not for diseases right here it's for risk factors screening for risk factors screening for major ncds and clinical assessments uh, you know Uh, getting anthropological measurements and things like that then uh, doing risk assessments for cvd and other diseases uh, other cancers also uh, then investigations uh, the by getting the random blood sugar and other uh, lipid profiles and things like that then appropriate referrals and lifestyle modifications so lifestyle modifications take time because we have to personalize uh, for each person now say now uh, professor vasanth pinto here may be a morning lark she may like to get up early and do things uh, whereas i am a night owl because i like to stay uh, more towards night rather than getting waking up in the night so i'm just telling you so we are different right so if you i'm going to do i'm going to set my strategy and think that i will exercise in the morning that is not going to happen because every day i will stay up late and get up uh, late in the morning so for that 
uh, I have to have self-awareness about myself, what uh, my habits and how I should uh, set my goals and targets and how I should strategize my uh, wellness plan. So that is important. Similarly, for your patients also, you need to have some uh, you know, understanding about their habits and behaviors. Okay, just touching upon other types of wellness, emotional wellness. So my practicing mindfulness and relaxation techniques, expressing emotions in healthy ways, setting boundaries in relationships, seeking support from friends, family, or mental health professionals when needed. For students, your mentors, counselors, we have uh, the capsule, so many uh, helping points you can uh, reach out. And then, sorry. So physical activity, uh, diet and emotional health. So if I quote uh, Professor La David Linden, a professor in neuroscience uh, from John Hopkins, Hopkins University of School of Medicine, exercise has a dramatic antidepressive effect. It blunts the brain's response to physical and emotional stress. So voluntary exercise is the single best thing one can do to slow the cognitive decline and that accompanies normal aging. So you can see two important uh, reasons why you should exercise. Right. If you don't want to age, it has anti-aging properties. And if you, uh, you know, uh, want to be more uh, mentally uh, balanced, then you need to do your uh, exercising. Right. So I'm sure, pretty sure, you all learn this in your physiology. So whether you get your uh, dose of happiness each day, just check. So dose means here dopamine oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. So these are called happy hormones or uh, feel-good hormones, right? So we all need this dose per day. So that is serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. So how can we get oxytocin? So it's called the love hormone, right? So cuddling, you can cuddle your children, you can cuddle a pet, your spouse, whoever, holding hands, falling in love, holding a baby, right? Feeding a baby. That is how you know the milk is uh, it's, uh, expressed. Uh, playing with pets and of course sex. And then endorphins. Exercise, which is called the runner's high day because you get a rush of uh, endorphins when you do uh, very uh, heavy exercise in particular. And so it's called the runner's high which means you feel high, then you, after a good run, right? But then you can uh, come to a stage where it will go off because it's just like, you know, getting addicted. Then dark chocolate, laughing, essential oils. So that is why people, uh, you know, light essential oil, uh, incense sticks or things in homes. Massages, medication, eating a delicious meal, listening to music and getting yourself exposed to UV light and sex. Then uh, how to elevate your dopamine level? Again, eating. Eating can elevate. Then foods rich in tyrosine. Shopping. Shopping can elevate. That is why people go and <laughs> when they feel down, they go and do shopping. Completing a task. Right. If you can do small, small tasks and finish it, then uh, you can get a dopamine rush and doing self-care activities, going to the beauty salon, putting on a mask, then having a good bath and all these things. Self-care activities can increase your dopamine levels. Then uh, celebrating achievements, small, small achievements, going out with friends, celebrating them. So, and even smell of cooking, baking. So, you know, you feel very relaxed when you uh, feel these things. So, again, you can get a dopamine rush through that. And of course, again, sex. So, sex, as you can see, uh, produces all these three happy hormones oxytocin, endorphins, and dopamine, but not serotonin. It has actually a negative effect on you. It reduces the uh, libido. 
So again, however, exercising can uh, secrete serotonin and sunlight. So that is why people come and lay in the beaches and get uh, you know, exposed to sun. And that is why they get depressed over where they have long winter hours uh, and no sunlight. And protein-rich foods, particularly where the foods rich in tryptophan and diets rich in complex carbohydrates. So here again, they recommend complex carbohydrates. We can't do without these uh, components in a diet. And social wellness, nurturing relationships and building support networks, depending, spending quality time with loved ones, participating in social activities. You can uh, you know, come and work with the Candy Society of Medicine, do their social activities, things like that, connecting with friends, with the medical fraternity, coming to events. And I must thank uh, Madam here for starting PEMSAC. Your, the students got an opportunity to mix and, you know, do the certain things through that, then joining support groups, seeking out positive social interactions, which is all necessary for a well ba balanced life. Okay, intellectual wellness. Again, must acknowledge what Candy Society of Medicine is doing right now. Uh, you know, having continued uh, medical education lectures like that because it uh, promotes uh, intellectual growth and development. And reading, learning new skills or hobbies, just because you came to medicine doesn't mean that you shouldn't pursue your other interests, maybe music, maybe photography. Again, I have put a uh, here, uh, uh, the flyer of, you know, the photographic uh, competition we had through KSM and uh, other, whatever, painting, uh, dancing, singing. Uh, they, uh, they started another uh, band uh, from KSM, which is again uh, good for your intellectual wellness. You have to keep the brain uh, going. And then the spiritual wellness. Again, it's uh, in, important to nurture inner self and uh, engage in spiritual or religious practices, uh, maybe meditation uh, uh, and then spending time in nature, practicing gratitude and reflection, then finding a meaning and purpose in life. So it's always good to reflect by yourself. What is the meaning of this life? then you will uh, come to some sort of, you know, balance. Uh, you will become a balanced person. Right. And then occupational wellness is also important because we know that we uh, come across various challenges in our day-to-day -day work. So setting boundaries between work and personal life is very important. Don't take your work home. Uh, I mean, we have to uh, most of the time, but then limit that at least make time for your family and then practicing time management and prioritization, seeking professional development opportunities and asking for help or support when needed. So these are some, a few to mention. Then environmental wellness, which is also creating a nurturing and supportive environment that promotes well-being. So it's good to declutter your environment and have a good space to live and spending time in nature, reducing exposure to environmental toxins and surrounding yourself with positive influences. So again, I have put a flyer here of the KSM uh, tree planting session that, uh, that was organized, which is very uh, good. And it's actually, a, uh, uh, I think it uh, gives uh, some sort of an influence and a message to the public in general. Okay. So this is where we are stuck now, the financial wellness. All of us are struggling. So I think we have to think and plan. Uh, so, but with this tax, impo the, the imposed tax and all that, that, you know, we, were, we came to a position where we are very uh, challenged, you know, and then uh, financial self-care involves managing your finances in a way that promotes your overall and will be and reduces stress related to money matters. So mindful spending, balancing, earning and expenditure is important, particularly when there are imposed taxes and insurance coverage, emergency funding and retirement planning all are important. So I don't have much answers for this, but um, you can always, you know, 
branch out or find new opportunities or as I said, even wellness can be something that you can use to generate uh, money. So as I have taught most of the students here, I don't know whether you all have gone through the health promotion, I have told you that behavior change is not easy. Not that any of us don't know these things, but to change ourselves and to uh, you know, practice a healthy lifestyle is not going to happen overnight, right? Not because we don't know, because we are not prioritizing our own health, maybe, but uh, behavior change take time, one step forward and two step backwards. That is how it happens. So eventually somehow we have to have this self-regulation and self-discipline to reach where we want us to be. So some important points is that you have to remember is that habits die hard. So however, we need to uh, make an uh, effort to build good habits. And uh, self-awareness, as I said, is very important. You have to reflect upon yourself and see where you stand. What is the importance of, uh, you know, you have given to your own health. And then uh, motivation is important. So if you have your family members, your children, your students, your uh, colleagues, you can motivate others also by role modeling as well as uh, uh, doing, uh, giving them the uh, facts. And then self-regulation, as I said, and self-discipline is important in this endeavor and strategies has to be, you know, have to be personalized and uh, uh, then only it will become effective. So in summary, we discussed about uh, what wellness is, the concept of wellness. It is not just a state of being as the, you know, in well-being. It's a uh, active process where you are going to uh, get your best, you know, best self out, functioning hundred percent. None of us are there, I think. So there's still uh, room for all of us to improve. Uh, and then I talked a lot about the physical wellness and uh, particularly about the diet, the physical activity, and sleep. And then uh, touched upon the other elements of wellness. So that's all I have to say. So I would like to acknowledge at this point, uh, the president, Prof. Samananakar and the Council of KSM 2024, uh, the uh, director, DD and medical staff of the National Hospital Candy, the vice chancellor, Dean, uh, head committee medicine and academic and non-academic staff of the Department of Community Medicine, the supportive staff and sponsors, uh, the uh, how do you pronounce this? I don't know. I thought it's Bego, but they, they said Bego pharmaceuticals and all participants uh, here who are here. Thank you. And I wish you wellness. Thank you very much, Sandeep, for your wonderful lecture. Now the lecture is open for questions. Do you have any questions? And I think Sandeep is happy to answer the questions. The thing is, uh, uh, Dr. Sentil, the, the thing is, I wish there was, but as you know, even quacks can uh, practice medicine in this country. We don't have a regulatory body or uh, some kind of, you know, and uh, a body that can actually look into these things. There are no rules and legislatives that uh, legislations that can support it. So, but the thing is, and the people are accepting these things because it, as I said, it offers a quick fix to their problem. 
and they are hopeful. So, and you know, these things are based on their own personal experience, maybe. What uh, it may have helped him. So, maybe he's, uh, he thinks that this is good, but he's a doctor, that's the problem. So, he has people then believe him more. So, the, if I wish, and I think we should uh, work on this, SLMC should take the initiative uh, more than the faculties, right? So, actually, I I am in. I thought, madam, that we should open up a wellness collaborative center at the Department of Community Medicine in time to come uh, so that we can address these issues. But then still we won't have the power of uh, working, but we can uh, try to educate people and, you know, uh, get them. That's We have to be more on. Uh, these are actually national figures. I think they have taken identified centenary sites and then uh, done them through. But most of the time, these are hospital-based studies. So most of them, you know, come in. To, as you said, you go through them and patients, and then if you suspect, it, uh, you take a blood sample and assess the levels and all that. So it's really expensive to do these assays, uh, you know, at community level with uh, big sample sizes. But of course, uh, as you correctly mentioned, we have to uh, find out more in about this. And I think even why don't we get together and do a study on this? If, if we can find grants, of course, it would be really helpful because uh, this is actually from a, a very good source. The Epidemiology Unit of Sri Lanka has published this in uh, March 2023. So, it should be based on scientific evidence. Uh, so according to that, uh, nine out of 10 are deficient. But when we give the supplements also, we may not have to take a daily, I don't know how you all recommend for the patients to take uh, the daily diet. Yeah, weekly one would be the, I think for prophylactic purposes would be better, but it's good. Why don't we get together and do a study? Yes. No. How much? Uh, I think uh, I will answer that question. Uh, only it can be in DU units, actually, for the renal uh, patients, they are doing. I think in private sector it is around sixteen thousand. And there, and there is a oh, correct here, yeah. but it is it is only available in uh, EU lab. It can be even not in the biochemical lab. But I think the machines and everything is available. Right? So if the consultant, uh, the chemical pathologist is really enthusiastic in uh, starting it, I think it is going to be really helpful. Otherwise, it is a very Expensive uh, Yes, uh, the thing is, we need, I think, more uh, using a more bigger sample. If we can come, they, that then this uh, answer would be more valid. But going by this, we can still make recommendations. As you said, since we are, we can't afford it. We don't have any other option. But uh, if we if we can get a good grant and then do the assessment. Right, ma'am. Otherwise, there's no hope because these things are costly, as we will say. 